Bobby Wrinkle, Adult Pro Programming Coordinator, and I welcome you to the 101 series. In tonight's program, you'll learn the basics of raising your own chickens, different types of chickens, and all about chickens. A reminder, different cities and counties do have different, different regulations regarding the keeping of chickens, so we suggest that you begin, before you begin any chicken endeavors, to check on these things before you run afoul. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is private banking specialist with Paducah Bank. She previously served, as you all may remember, as Paducah Main Street Director. She and her husband are the owner of Winchester Farms in the Grand Rivers area, a small flock breeder. The only small flock breeder in Kentucky that is MS and MG <laughs> clean certified, which means a guaranteed healthy birds. Let's welcome our guest, Melinda Winchester, as she presents Chickens 101. Thank you. Well, I'm going to have some help tonight. My husband's going to tag team this with me because we tag team everything on the farm. I couldn't do it without him. Um, thank you very much for coming out tonight. This is a really great crowd. We're really excited about presenting the Chickens 101 presentation to you all. I'm Melinda and this is Carrie and our farm is in the Grand Rivers area and we are a small flock breeder. We are also, um, we specialize in three of our favorite heritage breeds. So we've gone through several different breeds and we've settled down to three of our favorites which are the Lavender Orpingtons, the French Black Copper Morans and the Wheaton Blue Wheaton Americanas. Um, we are MPIP certified. Um, who knows what that means in here? Anybody? Really? Oh wait, I heard, what did you say? Did you say it? No, okay. <laughs> well, you were gonna get a prize if someone knew what that meant. Um, natural, na it's the National Poultry Improvement Program. And so a lot of farms will get this certification through their state um, Department of Agriculture, and it just means that they get tested once a year for three certain diseases, and I'll go through those with you here. So if you can buy them from an MPIP farm, that's, that's a good thing to do. Um, we are the only, only small flock breeder that has the MSMG clean certification, and that happened in 2013, and I'll share our story when we get to that part um, about what happened to us and how we got here, um, which is an important part of our story. Uh, we've had a lot of fun with our chickens. It's been a lot of hard work, especially for my husband, and um, we've learned a lot of hard lessons too, so we're hoping to share that with you all tonight and give you some information and maybe um, answer some questions too. So before I let him talk to you about chick basics, I'm going to introduce you to some of our other farm family members. So this is Amelia. She is our mini horse on the farm. And if any of you follow us on Facebook, you have seen the star of our farm, which is Jack the donkey. Jack loves to do selfies. Um, he's uh, very entertaining. And then, of course, our fierce guard dog, Barkley. This is Miss Maggie and our latest addition, her little baby, Dolly. And then these two are our latest addition, and this is Thelma and Louise. And people on Facebook helped me name those girls. Okay, so question of the night, why in the world do you all want chickens? So I'm gonna go through some categories and if these fit you, raise your hand for me. And these are pictures of some of our customers here. So um, you wanna do it because it's fun for the kids. Oh, fun for you, yeah, okay, or fun for you. Um, you wanna provide farm fresh eggs for yourself and your family. Oh, we got a lot of those. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing. That's really why we got started with it too. Um, pest control. Oh, great. Yeah, they're great tick eaters, aren't they? 4-H. Um, Your kids want to show poultry at 4-H. You might have to let her do that. <laughs> um, you want to raise chickens for the eggs or to sell the chicks. Anybody in here at that level? You would like that one too. Yeah? You sell the eggs now, don't you, honey? Okay. Um, who was I see? Did I see another hand? Anybody here interested in incubation and hatching their own? Got a couple? Okay, so we've got a last slide after questions that we can cover with you guys that specifically goes over that. I didn't know who we'd have in the crowd. Um, or you're just a crazy chicken lady, like Miss Emily. Yeah, up here. I figured I had a few of those in here. This is Paige, and she actually bought some of our lavenders, and she's actually going to show them at um, the fair. 
Okay, so I'm gonna let Carrie take it over for just a little bit on the new chickens. Who is my new chicken owners in here? I know you're a new chicken owner. Who else, anybody? Any, you chicken owner? Um, are you thinking about getting chickens, someone in here? Okay, good, so you need to listen up because this is what you need to do before you get your chickens. <laughs> so how many of y'all have, uh, I guess, bought baby chicks and brought them home and worked with them and raised them up? So we got several people. So we did this quite a few times, and I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be talking about the whole process of doing that, but pointing out some key things that you need and some of the pitfalls, because <clears throat> we've, had, we've had several of those. So when you get your baby chicks and you bring them home, and I think we did this once or twice where we maybe got some chicks, got them to the house, and didn't have everything set up for them. Um, but that's all right because most of the time you have the stuff that you need laying around the house. Get, get a nice big cardboard box, a, a, a tub. Uh, we have box brooders that look like this one down here in the bottom. Um, but you know, you can spend as much money as you want to on this. But the key things that you want to do to have a good experience with it is to have a good, reliable heat source. Um, the brooder needs to be safe for the chicks, and uh, you want to do all of this without burning down your house. So, yeah. So, you know, and <clears throat> Melinda pulled these pictures off the internet, and she kind of arranged them up there as kind of some examples. But when I really got to looking at them, I saw a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about that was in these pictures. So, everybody knows what the heat lamps are, right? So. You have just regular lamps that look just like this, and then you've got heat lamps. And one way to tell is, is the ceramic in that's right in here. Okay, so that, that can take a little bit more heat uh, than the ones that are the, just the plastic sockets, right? The other thing that most people do, and I've done this too until I about burned something up, was taken, taking these uh, guards off, all right? So um, if you set this up, and maybe it's not set up real secure, it drops off and gets down into the litter. Uh, this isn't gonna happen while you're sitting there watching the birds, it's gonna happen overnight, and you're gonna end up uh, catching something on fire, melting through your plastic, maybe even killing your birds. So definitely keep the guards on, it's a pretty simple thing, but uh, you know, just remember, remember to do that. If you don't have them, they're, they're not real expensive, the whole light fixture, so just go and get you some new ones. Um, the other thing is, when you look at these brooders up here, we've got two of them that just have one light. And we've done this. We've, we've had a brooder, one light sitting there. We go to bed, we get up the next morning, come out, feed the chicks. The light burned out. And all of our chicks were laying on the bottom of the brooder. And they didn't make it. So <laughs> it's, it's, it seems simple that uh, you know to have some sort of a backup but it's not a real easy fix you know to you could have two lights but if the brooder is pretty small then the whole area inside the brooder gets pretty hot so you want your your heat lamp to be a foot and a half two foot from the bottom and the baby chicks will kind of move in and out under the light to wherever they're comfortable right so uh, if you got two lamps, you got a backup. If one goes out, you've still got one that's, that's lit there, but it's a little expensive. And like I said, if the brooder isn't a big area, then the whole area inside the brooder gets pretty warm. So one of the things that, that I came up with, and I just went and got some new stuff today so that it didn't look cruddy like some of our stuff does. But for Christmas, um, you can buy these down at uh, Lowe's, and they're, they're fairly cheap at Christmas time. They're a little bit more expensive this time of the year, but it has, a, it has a, a light sensor on it. So you can set this up, um, hang it over the side of your brooder. You'll plug in, this is the other thing. And I'm a safety guy by profession, so I, I kind of look at, at some of these things from a safety perspective, but you know, don't go cheap on your, uh, on your extension cord. You're gonna be running some pretty heavy amperage through power in the heat lamp, so you'll need that. But 
plug your light into one side of it, plug your, your little uh, light sensor into the other, uh, one of the other slots, plug one of your uh, heat lamps into your, uh, your sensor, and then what you'll have is one light that comes on, the other light won't because there's light there. But in the event that the light uh, goes out, it gets dark, the other light comes on. So uh, the beauty of, of these things is that, because there's probably people in here going, well, once the light comes on, the light sensor is going to pick that up and it's going to go off again. And that does happen, but they're set on a 15 minute timer. So it'll stay on for 15 minutes, it'll go off and immediately it'll come right back on again. So it's, it's not off long enough for the, for the chicks to get harmed. And, you know, it'll be there so you'll notice it, you'll be able to get replaced. Uh, the bedding that's on the bottom, that's going to be key for absorption. It's going to be key for the baby chicks if, uh, if you have a slick surface that the chicks are walking around on, they can get splay leg, which will, their, their legs will split, and if you don't correct it right away, um, it won't correct itself. So you won't have that problem if you have a screen that's on the bottom of your, uh, on the bottom of your brooder, or if you have the stuff that's in the, the litter that's in the bottom. And we use- Pine shavings. We use pine shavings, okay. about medium size for ours. Um, the other thing is your, is your water. You want a clean water source and, and food, of course. Those are all pretty easy. Oop, I'm getting the signal. Okay, so um, one of the hardest things to do with chickens is to keep clean water. And those of you that have, that have had it before, yeah. I mean, you can put fresh water in and a day later it's all crudded up. So I know probably y'all have seen the little, the little watering nipples. And those, those are just lifesavers. And we've, I brought one of our buckets. And, you know, you can go down to, the, down to the store. And actually, you can buy the whole bucket set up. It costs about 15 or 20 bucks. But if you, if you go and you get, um, you get some of the nipples, you can just buy a bucket for two and a half bucks. You can use it for a year. And when it... Uh, when the bucket starts to wear out, get a new bucket, put them back in, and you're good to go again. And I go drill a hole in the top, and I put a nice little filler spout. It makes it easy to put water in instead of trying to pull the top off. If you need directions on how to do that, just email me or message me, and I'll send them to you on how he does it. So in the wintertime, we, we actually move the watering bucket into the coop, and we'll put a heat lamp inside the coop to kind of keep that water from freezing. But then... And you also have this problem if you've got a run where you've got this water hanging. So um, you get water that drips. When the chickens are drinking, water will drip down, and it'll get wet underneath it. Or if it's inside, of course, the litter gets wet. So this little guy right here, we set these up, and, and you put them about, well, probably about that high, probably 18 inches off the ground. Put the little pan underneath. They can still drink, and any dripping water goes into the pan. And this is just simple, cheap little stuff, but you drill one uh, or screw it down and then put another one in on top of it. Then when it gets dirty, you can just pull the top one off, wash it out, and stick it back in there. It makes it real easy to clean. And the, so, the litter doesn't get wet that way inside the coop. Yeah, yeah, and they'll actually, if it, if it drinks and starts to collect in that pan, they'll drink, drink the that water, water also. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real easy way to kind of keep things clean keep and definitely give them good clean water all the time. Um, the, our feed, a lot of the times what we'll do is uh, for the first week we'll put in a medication into the feed, a chick starter medication. Uh, after that, and that's generally just kind of mixed in with the regular chick starter feed, and then uh, we'll take that out of the feed and then just use the chick starter for a while. So in the brooder, you're gonna leave your chicks in the brooder for six weeks, five, six weeks, until the feathers start coming in. And then at that point, you can start moving them into your coop. This is, this is where we move our uh, juveniles. juveniles. Yeah, we'll, 
we'll keep them in the brooder for maybe six weeks, and then we set them up in this mobile kind of temporary space where we can actually move them in and out into the sun or fresh air. And it's pretty easy to clean, and, and we can get quite a few little chicks in there. So we move on to the coop. With our certifications that we have with our farm, we've, we've got to, uh, well, I may just talk about that here in a minute when I show the next slide. But you have uh, tractor coops, which is the one on the right over here, and that looks like something that probably somebody just built themselves. It's a, it's a pretty cool concept because the area where the chickens are out in their run uh, will get, they'll eat the grass and, and eventually there isn't any grass there. You can just pick this little guy up and scoot it over to some fresh grass. So they get the bugs, they get the nutrients from the grass and, and uh, it's, just a, it's just a neat concept. Um, lots of, lots of uh, coops out there of any shape and size that you can buy down at the farm store or from the Amish folks. Uh, this is the first one that we bought and we still use it. And a couple of the key things that you'll notice with ours, let me go, there we go. Um, our outside run is, is covered on the top. We, we do that, one, to kind of help keep the inside of the run from getting real nasty when it gets wet, but more specifically for wild birds. Um, wild birds, when it comes to chicken diseases, and Melinda's going to cover a whole lot of that here in a minute, is it's something that you need to be careful of because they do carry a lot of diseases, and you don't want them landing on top of your run, pooping down into the coop, and then the chickens eat that and end up getting sick themselves. So the other thing is the predator wall. So that's kind of dug down into the ground and any type of a predator that may try to dig and get into the coop uh, gets stopped at that point. And you're probably looking at the gray, blah, what am I trying to say? The, the wire uh, cage. Yeah, the, the size of the wire that's on our cage, the openings, and it's about two inches. So it's, it's way too big. The wild birds can fly right in if we got our feet out there or we're throwing scratch in. Uh, the wild birds would just fly right in and, and join the chickens. So what we ended up doing was putting a, a, a bird, bird wire, bird mesh around that portion of the coop. And it's been on there for a couple of years and really easy to put up and, and wasn't much of a problem. So this is an outdoor run of our, of our big coop. Those are some of our uh, uh, lavender orpingtons. And in this picture, you can see the water, but you can also see the, the barrier that goes down into the ground that keeps the growing animals out. So that's our, our breeding coop. And you can see that our runs are covered. We got roofs over those. The, the mesh that we used on the outside runs is small enough that wild birds can't get in there. And it just kind of keeps everything tight and in one place, easy to clean and just, a, just an all-around um, secure. secure facility for our birds. So I'm going to give it back over to Melinda. OK. So hot chicks or cold feet? What do you think is harder on the chickens, the heat or the cold? The heat. heat. You guys know your chickens. Most people say the cold. Good girl. All right. So we are going to talk about the heat um, because it, it can kill your chicken just within a day if, if they get heat stressed and, and get overheated. So we're going to talk a little bit about what signs to look for. Um, the ideal temps for chickens, which I kind of like these temps too, are 65 to 75 degrees. Once it starts bumping up into the 80s and the 90s, your chickens can't sweat, so they pant. And um, they start panting, they uh, create more carbon dioxide and that really start is hard on their body. So mild heat stress. If you start noticing just a little bit of panning, um, reduced egg laying, you're not getting as many eggs as you were. Um, if you're hatching lower hatch rates, their combs and their waddles will start getting pale if they're starting to get heat stress. That's one, those are signs you can watch for. 
if they get severe heat stress, and we actually had a lady contact us who had sold a beautiful rooster to a woman. The woman met her to pick up the rooster, and she put him in the back of a pickup truck that had a cover lid on it, and it was 85 outside. So guess what happened to this poor rooster? In a day, it died. And so this lady was accusing the other lady of selling her a sick bird. Um, he had every single sign, and we'll talk about acidosis, of acidosis. And what happens is you, they start labored panning. Their organs actually shut down, and they'll have bloody diarrhea, um, not eat, drink. And once that starts happening, there's just nothing you can do for the bird if, it, if you don't catch it. So really watch for the mild signs. This is what you can do to help your chickens in the summer. One, make sure your coop is ventilated. We actually put fans up in the windows in the summer to help that air circulate. Um, also, if your chickens pasture and they're out, you can provide a mister like this bottom picture and they will go in and out of that mist. Just like if you have horses that your horses do, that'll help keep them cool. If they're not pastured, you can buy a little hand mister. Now don't soak them down, just <laughs> spritz them a little bit. But if you notice your chicken is really getting in distress, you need to cool your chicken off with some cool water. Just bathe them into a bucket like that, just like you would a child you know, that has a high fever. You just want to cool that body off and just cool them off like that. Um, of course, they need shade. Um, that's a given, so just make sure they have a, a place to get out of the heat. Um, also, electrolytes are very important in the summer. Who puts electrolytes in their water for their chickens in the summer? Okay, good, I got a few of you. Um, these are a couple, the top one's a very simple recipe. Um, I actually printed both of these off and there's copies on the table, so if you wanna take them with you, um, just help yourself. Um, the bottom one, if you have a chicken that's in distress, they really like the sweet, you can give them some of that to get them to take it sooner, but that does not last more than 24 hours because of the sweet component. So don't put it in the water and leave it. I do popsicles for my chickens. So when it starts getting hot every morning before I leave for work, I actually use a muffin pan. And I get my peas, my corn, my strawberries, blueberries, put them in, fill it up with water, freeze it, and then when I get home in the afternoon, I pop them out, take them out to my chickens. They love it. The, the ice actually cools them off. Every afternoon, my chickens get popsicles. So you can, you can make bigger ones with different plastic tubs, but I recommend doing it. It's a great treat for them, and it cools them off. You put, I put peas and corn. You can put strawberries, blueberries, just any of those kind of things that they like to eat. And they do <coughs> like it a lot. First time they do it, they'll kind of go around it like, what the heck is that? But once, once they figure it out, they'll pretty much attack you to get to the popsicles. All right, so let's talk about cold weather just a little bit. Um, you still wanna have really good ventilation in your coop when it's cold, because you don't want the moisture to build up in your coop. Um, and you wanna make sure that your chickens stay dry. Um, you don't want them to, to be wet and go out in the cold, and then they're gonna get frostbite. Um, one way you can help, especially you have um, roosters that have big combs. Our French copper morans have um, huge combs. You can take a little bit of Vaseline, and not a, not a bunch, and just a little bit, and put it on your rooster, on the wattles, you can put them on your hens, and that will help prevent the frostbite um, on their combs and their wattles. So unless you have a mean flogging rooster, you might just let him deal with it. <coughs> Um, make sure their roost is out of the draft. You've got the good ventilation down low, but make sure the roost is out of the draft. They will huddle together, together to stay warm. And I think the biggest challenge in the winter is to keep your water from freezing. Um, Carrie, you want to show them that one water heater? Oh, yeah. um, we have a water heater light um, that he puts um, our waters on. And then we also have um, a thermoelectric thermo switch. And we use that not only for the waterers, but for the lights in the winter. That's, that's the water heater, and show them the switch. So then we plug them into oh. that switch, yeah. and at 32 it kicks 32 on. Degrees. If it reaches 32 inside our coop, it will actually kick on our lights and our heater. Um, it shuts off at 45 degrees. So that saves you money in the winter. And we, we, this year was the first year we started using them and we saved money significantly through the winter months just with those little ceramic thermoelectric and these, switches. These things, you can buy them already made and they cost about 35 or $40, but for about 
15 or 20, you can make your own. And the, the light that we use is just a 40 watt bulb. And believe it or not, if your water, and, but this is using a standard waterer, so if you've got to run outside that you can't have water inside, and the metal waterers, the water, standard waterer that you always see, um, you'll want to use a metal waterer. We've used plastic ones on these, and they just, the, the heat doesn't go through the plastic like it does metal. But you can set that on the ground, plug it in, 40 watt, or 40, yeah, 40 watt mm -hmm. uh, bulb will keep the, uh, keep the water from freezing. Yeah, and I think this year when it got down, like into the tens, we had those yeah. two weeks where it was extreme, we had to bump it up to a 60 watt because it actually still froze. 90. 90, bump 90, 90 watt, 90. okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a thermo switch. You can get those at, uh, well, Tractor Supply will have them. And I, I, I'm wanting to say Lowe's probably has them too. Yeah. 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 Do you use those too? Yeah. Yep. And they work. And they work great. Um, uh, we use supplemental light in the winter to keep our chickens laying, and they work. They work great um, for the lights. But we also have those on timers. Um, feed your chickens extra scratch in the winter. It gives them more calories, and they'll need it to to keep warm. And then we use deep litter um, in the in the winter. Um, does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay, so deep, <laughs> deep litter, what we do is um, when we start out in the fall, we do a full clean on the coops, we put the litter in, and then when we go in, we don't clean that out, we put the new litter on top, and that old litter, litter holds some heat in there. So throughout the winter, we do that, um, just to kind of help with hold that heat in, because that old litter will. When you're saying litter, what are you talking about? Uh, the pine shavings. Pine shavings. Pine shavings, yep. No, not cat litter. Yeah, sorry. Pine shavings, yeah. So you just kind of put it, the new fresh stuff on top, and then you keep the older on the bottom. So it's harder to clean out, in, like we just did our clean out in January before yeah. we had our new certification. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can. We yeah. Compost all yeah. Of that. It's great for composting and stuff. Um, other thing that we did this winter, especially, is we always had a backup waterer ready to switch out because they will freeze up on you and then that way it's easy just to grab your new one you get home from work if your water's frozen if you don't have electricity to your coop and then you can just swap out those waterers real quick and easy okay so now we're going to play a game because everybody asked me about predators okay so we're going to do a game off of the the clue you all have you some of you played clue when you were younger okay so it's called who killed mrs cluckett so there's your track, and this is the description. They will more than likely tunnel under your coop. They will also stake out a coop and will often wipe it out if they get in. Who is this predator? Huh? You said coyote first, right? Coyote. Yeah, I got some smart people in here. There he is, Mr. Coyote. All right, here's our next one. There will be several birds gone. Feathers will be strewn on the ground, and you will find feathers away from the coop. And I had this guy patrolling mine this, uh, this winter when we had that snow, but he didn't get in my coop. What did you say, honey? Dog? dog? No, that's a good guess. It's not a dog. Fox. Let's see. Yep, there he is. We have a lot of foxes out at our place. We used to have one before we, we um, got our new certification. And every morning we would leave, let our chickens out in the morning, go to work, come home, there'd be a chicken gone. And we were home for some reason, and that fox would sit on the hill and wait for us to leave for work. And then he would come down and get our chickens. But we, we uh, took care of him. We relocated him. Okay, so this guy will normally kill multiple birds. Most of the time you'll find the body still in the coop because they have trouble getting them out. They will rip open the, sorry honey, open the neck and eat at the crop. And they're also good at stealing eggs. No, you got it, raccoon. Who said that? Who said that? <laughs> good job. Okay, we'll gain access to the coop through any small opening. They like to steal the eggs and the baby chicks, and occasionally they'll get an adult bird. They will usually bite the neck and tear open the stomach. 
and they'll leave the dead birds in the coop. And who said possum? You said possum? There you go. Oh, I don't like this. Carrie, Carrie had an interesting encounter with a possum mm -hmm. once in our coop, and he used his fishing bow to get him out. <laughs> <laughs> he was way up under it. This predator will go after baby chickens and eggs, but rarely attack an adult bird. They have very poor eyesight. They're nocturnal. They will go after your eggs first. Usually a dog or a cat will run them off, and the eggs will be opened at one end and eaten. And if they do get your bird, they'll eat the neck and the head. You guys are smart. Did you say that one again? Who said, you said that one. Yep. There we go. All right. Chickens killed aimlessly. You commonly find a bird with a broken neck, and the bird will be left where it was killed. Anybody have this happen at their farm? We've had our neighbor's dogs do it to us. And there they are, man's best friend, but not the chickens. So, all right, so we got to talk about these two. So we got the owl and the hawk. And if your chickens pasture out, they're in the most danger of these two right here. Um, but the thing you need to remember that both of these birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So um, if you have that problem, um, we play, I've played music out there. Sometimes it helps, sometimes they don't care. They still come in and they'll, they'll get your chickens. But, um, when they're doing you damage, can't you kill them though? I, mean, I, don't, legally, I don't know. You know, I'm not know. qualified to answer that question, but you could <laughs> probably call the conservation department and ask them. <laughs> Um, I still believe that they are protected under that act from what I've read. So I've got people shaking their heads. Yes, they are. So um, they are a protected species. Ma yes, ma'am. I was a wildlife rehabber, and I know it's $100,000 and a year in jail. Okay, there you go. Wow. Just to even possess the feathers. Really? Okay. So that's an expensive... Well. Act there. Yeah. It's cheaper finding chickens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So healthy chickens and disease. So we're going to talk about this a little bit because there's a, a there's a lot of different diseases out there and a lot of them act the same way. Um, lice. This is one of the reasons you want to keep wild birds away from your birds because they are the number one common reason that you will have lice with your chickens if the wild birds intermingle with them or get around them. Wild birds carry lice. So symptoms are the scratching, pecking a lot, um, the feathers look dry and ruffled. That's actually a picture of what you could look for if you suspect that your chicken might have lice that has the white matting down at the base of the feathers. Um, and it'll spread from chicken to chicken. Lice prevention, check your chickens a lot if you see them scratching a lot. What we do is we use this poultry dust here so this is a good thing to have on hand. And we um, sprinkle a little bit in the nesting boxes. And then you can take a pantyhose and fill it up with the poultry dust and then gently like just dust under the wings. You gotta be careful, you don't want them to inhale the dust. So you just do it very lightly, but do it under the wings and that can help prevent it. Um, co uh, coxidosis, it is a parasite. Um, and the symptoms are pale combs, wattles, really the, the big one, because there's so many of these that mimic other diseases, is the bloody um, diarrhea and the mucus in the diarrhea. If they're not in a hot environment to where it could be acidosis, it's probably coxidosis. Now, you can prevent it by changing your topsoil. Um, it's more prevalent in the spring and the summer then in the winter, you really don't see it a lot. So change your topsoil out, like in your runs and stuff. Um, we do our runs twice a year. We do it in the spring and the fall, but we use sand. We have found, um, Carrie puts a gravel base in, and then we put sand on top of it, and the gravel helps with the drainage. Um, also, your medicated, the medicated starter that you saw at the beginning that you add into the chick, the chick feed, that also helps the, it prevent it in baby chicks, and baby chicks are really susceptible to this. The other thing you can do if your chickens do get it, you suspect they have it, you can buy cord, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, and you just put that in the drinking water, treat the whole flock. Can you use the egg while you're treating? No, ma'am, you cannot. And it'll tell you too, 
Um, even when you deworm them, we don't deworm our chickens twice a year with wazine in the water. Don't eat the eggs when you after you deworm. I think it's for a week or two, week at least. It's not all week. that long. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a week. Yeah. Um, avian pox. So I guess they couldn't use chicken pox because the people <laughs> took the chicken pox. So they've got avian pox, which really is about the same thing. It's blistery sores. It will get on their eyes and it can it can blind them. Um, vet, you can use vetricin on them, and I'll show you that. Um, I've got some of it up here. Okay, so we're going to talk about Merrick's disease. Has anybody heard of this disease? Is that in your book, the guy that got the health book? Okay. Um, Merrick's, it's a virus. Um, it will cause the paralysis, the lameness, um, and what it does is it um, creates tumors in the bodies of the chicken. Merrick's, there is no cure. And if your chicken, if, if you get it tested and your chicken has Merrick's, it's in your ground and it does not go away. So it is not a good thing to have. And I'm telling you this for a reason and you'll, you'll realize that in here in just a minute. Okay, so every once in a while your chickens will have some eye problems, but chickens don't get colds. So if your chicken is coughing and sneezing, it's not a cold, something else. But it's usually an injury from like another chicken gets pecked at their eye. So Vetricin plus eye wash, get that, have that on hand. Let me see if this is my eye wash. You can buy this at Rural King. This is actually for wounds here. Um, Rural King, Tractor Supply, the co-ops, they all carry the Vetricin. But what you need to be careful is the poultry medicines are very specific because they have Vetricin that you can use for cows, dogs, everything else. But poultry is its own product for Vetricin, so make sure you get the poultry. So you um, rinse out their eye, check for injury. Um, if, if the chicken has an open sore somewhere on its head, you need to take it away from the other chickens because they will actually pick on that chicken um, and you want to you want to isolate that chicken until it, it heals up. You can also get teramycin at those stores. Um, it's like a like pink eye, like when we have pink eye and we put the, the medicine in our eye. It's the same thing, but it's for chickens. Um, if the problem persists or your other birds start showing the same signs, you have a different problem. So um, you need to get your, one of your chickens tested to see what it is. And the, the vets can do that for you. We use a vet in Mayfield and he's wonderful. All right, so here you're going to hear a little bit about our story and what happened to us. Um, we had chickens, what, about two years? We had about two, two years, years, and we had decided that we wanted to start <clears throat> selling the eggs and the chicks, and we had started investing money in the hatchers and the incubators and our big coop, and we decided to start building our breeding flock, not knowing some of the risks that were out there um, with disease. We bought some chickens from an NPIP certified farm in Missouri. <clears throat> we paid high dollar for these birds. I don't even remember. It was what? $30, $30 each for these birds, and they were just juveniles. They weren't even grown birds. Um, brought them home. We did have them in a separate area, but we noticed in about five weeks after we brought these birds that our birds started getting sick and dying. Um, they were acting like they were paralyzed. Um, I found one just dead. Um, we thought, because if you search those symptoms online, Merrick's is going to pull up. And so after about the fourth or fifth bird, I called our vet because I'm like, we have Merrick's. We have Merrick's on our farm. We don't know what to do. So we brought the bird down to him. They tested the bird because he said, I have been in practice for 40 years, and I've never had a case of Merrick's in this area, ever. We ended up testing positive for MS and MG, which is Mycoplasma synovia and Mycoplasma galliseptica. They are a bacteria. And this is, these are the things that shut down the Kentucky swap meets the last two years. And I think at the fair last year, they didn't even let the poultry show for exhibits because this was going around Kentucky so bad. And I think Georgia, Indiana, and California got hit with it too. So it is a bacteria. It is very contagious. And we believe we cross-contaminated our birds unknowingly from the sick birds to our healthy birds. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So the state came out, called us up, because our proximity 
is very close to a commercial poultry house. So they said, you all, we really need you to depopulate your flock. You have this. And let me tell you, you don't want to go through that. They came out and did it for us, gave us the chemicals to clean everything, and we just let the ground sit for three months. Of course, it's a, it's a bacteria. Once the host is gone, it dies very quickly, which is the good thing about these two. Um, Carrie, we did so much research, and we were finding out the experts, they don't know anything about this. No one could give us a straight answer about how do we prevent this? How, you know, what do we do to keep from getting this again? We finally got in touch with um, a gentleman at Purdue University who actually wrote the federal regulation on MSMG clean certification. And we called up the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and we said, we want this. What do we have to do to do it? And they said, well, we don't do that. And I said, you're in the MPI program. Yes, you do. Figure it out. <laughs> so they made phone calls, figured it out, and now they work with us every three months and come out to our farm, test our birds, and we're like their pilot farm because no one thought it could be done. That everyone kept saying it's in all chickens. All chickens have this. That is not true. It is a bacteria. So we are the only small flock breeder, even on the national, you look at the national registry, there's not another one. So we're pretty proud of that. This is what it looks like. No, the new birds brought it in to Even our. They were certified birds. Yes. Or no, they they weren't at that time. We were building our flock at that point. No, yeah. those birds. No, he's asking. They oh. did come from an MPIP farm. Yes. But MPIP does not test for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, MPIP test, and I, I think did I do avian influenza yet? No. It tests for avian influenza, um, Salmonella, and uh, pylorum. Those are the three tests that it tests for does not test for MSMG. It's a completely different test. And if you have existing birds now that are running all around, you probably don't want them to come in and, and test your flock. Just because if it tests positive, it's tragic. So this is what it looks like. It looks like a cold. This is um, MG, Mycoplasma galliceptica. So you, they sneeze, they cough, they have a watery nose, their eyes get goopy. If your chickens are doing this, you probably need to get one of them tested. It's very, very, very contagious. And there's no cure for it. You can, you can treat it, you can, you can give them, but they're always going to be a carrier. Um, this is Mycoplasma synovia. Very similar to Merrick's. Paralyzed, affects the joints. Um, this one transmits vertically from the hen to the egg. So the other dilemma that we had is how do we start off with a fresh flock that we know is not already infected. You know, hatch our own eggs, but the, the, the eggs could be infected. So Carrie got with, um, do you, are you all familiar with Brevet Laboratory in Hopkinsville? They work with Murray State. He talked to the director there and they came up with a procedure to DNA test our unhatched eggs to make sure they didn't have this. So that's how we got the clean flock. We had one batch of eggs from Texas that tested positive for a mycoplasma and we just got rid of those. We weren't willing to take the risk again. Okay, so this is what you need to get if you don't have them. You're a new chicken owner, right? Okay. Um, keep these on hand because when you need them, you need them like right then and you don't want to have to run to Tractor Supply or Rural King or it'll be closed or it's Sunday night. So um, Liquid B12 is great for chickens that are, are stressed, um, they're not eating well, just give them a little boost. It's like giving them a bunch of vitamins and you can add it to their water. If you have one in particular that's kind of pale, not looking good, get your eyedropper. Keep those eyedroppers on hand, they're great. You can give them a little bit um, in their mouth. The Vetrisin Plus, that's the wound. That's for wounds for chickens. Um, so I keep that on hand. Cord, this is what um, you give your chickens if they get the Cori auspice, you put it in their water. Baby chicks. Um, say you order some baby chicks from the hatchery, they get delivered, they've been in, in the postal truck and they're stressed from that trip. So um, I always give them a little bit of save a chick and then you can also buy the electrolytes. If you don't want to make it yourself, you can buy electrolyte already pre-made that you can just stick into your water. 
Um, also, oyster shell grits really important to have available to your chickens. I've got a bag of each one here on the table that you can come up and look at. Um, it's a calcium supplement, so it's really good aids in strong eggs for them. If your chickens pasture, they're all over, they're going to pick up the insoluble grit, which is this darker gray one, naturally on the ground. They'll pick it up from stones and rocks and things like that. Okay, so here's a few tips because I know you all don't want to go to the extent that we do for biosecurity because of our, our certification, but there's some really easy things you can do just to kind of help keep your chickens healthy. Um, one, know who you're buying your birds from. MPIP doesn't always mean that they don't have MSMG, but you can ask for references. You know, can you give me some names of people who bought from you? So try to find that out. These are the diseases that MPI tests for. Um, AIPT and then the salmonella. Um, if you go to another farm that has hens, chickens, birds, um, wash your car tires off before you go home. Because if they just happen to have that bacteria on their farm, you can bring it back to your farm on your tires of your car. The state doesn't even come to our farm until they completely wash their trucks off because of our certification. Also, when you go in Rural King, Tractor Supply, all the baby chicks are in there. Well, you know other people from other farms are in there walking around. So we just keep extra shoes that we wear in that store, and then before we get home, we take them off, wash, just, just spray bleach water on them, just to be safe. That's what we do. You don't have to do it, but that's a step. It's simple, easy to do to protect your birds, especially with what Kentucky was going through last year. It was just going around like wildfire. Um, again, don't allow the wild birds to free range, you know, with scratch with your birds. Keep your water um, accessible to your birds only. Don't let your dogs or cats get into it. Um, when you purchase your new birds, any bird, any age, you keep them quarantined, separate for at least five weeks. Just watch them close. Um, the other thing you need to watch out for is do not cross contaminate. Your, those birds may not be sick like ours were, but Feed those birds last. Go do everything with your other birds and then go feed those birds because you could get cross-contaminate something on your clothes to your birds. And we think that's probably what happened with us because we weren't really thinking on that scale that these birds are sick. Um, and it, if you want to hatch, it's safer to hatch your own chicks um, than to buy chicks or adult birds. Okay, so we're going to take some questions, but I do have some slides on incubation. And I have a slide on spraddle leg because I had someone send me a question specifically about that, and I don't know if she's here tonight. But um, we show you how you can fix spraddle leg and baby chicks. So, yeah. I have a question. Uh, of course, you live on a farm. Mm -hmm. You probably don't have neighbors around. I do have neighbors on the other side, but it's more of a farm area. It's not in town. Mm -hmm. What is the range for birds keeping them out of your neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a rooster? No, I don't have any right oh, now. I'm just asking. Oh, there's, there's not really a range. They're going to kind of go where they want to go. Now, if you have a rooster, he'll tend to try to keep them rounded up um, with your birds. But we so have... Outside, we, start saying, here, chicken, chicken. Yeah, I mean, they, they... Other than fencing in your own yard, is that the only I mean, they'll go across the street if there's something across the street they want to eat. You're fencing in your yard. Um, they, they can fly up and over, but, I, you know, with if there's trees... I mean, we have roosts in our big poultry area that go all the way to the ceiling, so your chickens can fly up and over. Um, yeah, I, the our chickens, we've got neighbors on the other side of the road occasionally they would go over there and we've got another neighbor that's probably four or five hundred I don't know 600 feet away across the street you know, yeah. and down but our chickens never really went over there so I mean they they stayed pretty much around the house they stayed around the house yeah. correlation to the most expensive landscaping that's probably yeah. it. Or if they have a garden, the chickens will go eat their garden. You know, they like tomato. They love tomatoes. tomatoes. So, if you have a garden and you have chickens, make sure you fence off your garden. So, but typically, you know, it's more of a deterrent when they're walking, and they just kind of turn. I, I mean, they will fly up and over, but we haven't ever had that problem. Even when our chickens were free ranging all over, 
So, well, I had a chicken. We had, well, I think it was a rooster. Two different roosters. One was eating our cat food, and the other was where the bird feeders were. Yeah. So they're, they do like cat food. And yeah. I, yeah, everybody, everything likes cat yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't even know where the chickens came from. Cause, uh, <laughs> so you had somebody else's chickens come into your house. They were yeah. from way down the street, I guess, because yeah. I don't know where they live. You must have had some good cat food for them to come to your house. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about any tips for like integrating Chicken yeah, chicken. actually, Phyllis just went through that with one of our roosters, and it seemed to work out pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, we suggest that you get like the big dog pens, cages. Um, keep your new bird in there or birds. Um, have the feed in the water. Make sure they're not in the, the sun, um, and then just let the other chickens they get used to him. For your new birds are um, protected, and I think what you left him in there what a week. Yeah, we about because we had another rooster. Yeah, which found a new home. Because <laughs> this one is just he's in charge. And I wanted to ask you this too. I don't mean to yeah. interrupt oh, your question, right, yeah. but our our egg popular our laying eggs really went up when this new rooster came. Oh, I don't know if the girls just all like him. They probably <laughs> do. They're like, we got this new. That she got one of my lavender roosts. Oh, he is so beautiful. And yeah. Yeah, they're all trying to attract that, that rooster to them. So, um, so, did we finish your question? They have the sprays, like at King. I would not waste my money on the sprays. It's like the, the spray they give you for to keep the cats out of your mulch bed. It doesn't work. Um, yeah, I would just keep them. But you want them to get to know each other, and that's the best way. But I can tell you, a, a flock of hens will kill a full-size rooster, um, if you don't do introduce them slowly. No, no. We had we've had it. We just had an egg eater, which we had to isolate her out real quick. So um, I saw another hand. You have not had a problem with snakes? I've had them eat chicken snakes. Eat pretty good chicken. Um, we we only had one snake in our pullet area, but it was after we moved the birds out. So I've not had a problem with snakes, but our donkey does a really good job keeping the snakes population down. I think we've been out there 10 years, and I think I've only seen two or three snakes in that whole 10 years because our donkey helps keep that population down. But snakes pretty much can get in just about anywhere, anywhere. I mean, Yes, sir. I got two questions. One is I got one hen of the Amer Americana. Uh, her, she's full of just laid about 15 eggs this year. But her, the shell on the, on the outside of her shell has a, looks like a calcium deposit mm -hmm. in a rough spot. I've tried to break off the fingernail. The other two are smooth as still. I'm wondering what that is. And then also, the water, I mean the wormer, all you can buy is that, uh, what's that? Why is Wazing. It? Wazing. Wazing. Yeah. I don't have much faith in it, but I don't know. I, so I periodically, and I don't know if we can help, I put a little like a teaspoon of uh, uh, bleach in, in a gallon of water or something. And they, they leave it, they drink it just like food. I don't know if that helps. Oh, okay, I've okay. I've never heard about putting bleach in as a dewormer. I would. I would caution you on that just because it's a chemical and you don't know what else it might hurt inside the chicken. Um, some chickens do get those little deformities as the as the egg is coming through. Um, are you giving them a calcium supplement? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, all that stuff that you they get all that plus a lot of other stuff on top of it. You know, I give them canned meat, I give them all kinds of stuff. Okay. Bread. They just, they'll climb the walls when they see me coming. Okay. Their eyes sparkle. Just some, some, <laughs> Sounds like you're feeding your chickens really well. <laughs> I do. I do give my chickens fresh peas in the winter. I give them. I give them peas to supplement up their protein. But some chickens just the the eggs just 
have that deformity because we've had a couple of ours that have that too and it just happens as the process comes. How old is your chicken? Is she? Okay. Do you know which one's laying the? Was she still laying eggs after 12 years? Yeah. Wow, you're doing something right. That's but pretty amazing. Yeah. Game, but they had sets of game right. You had a question, sir? How do you get your chickens to poop in one area? <laughs> <laughs> That's like telling your dog to poop in one area. You, you figure that one out, well, you know, you, you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and and that's just the deformity coming out. But um, you might want to up her calcium. It, I mean, you probably already did it. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. It, okay. I saw two more hands. Is there anything that causes us to have chickens that would lay, especially when they start laying? There's nothing that causes that. I have I found the bigger the egg sometimes you can get the double the double yolks. But the younger the chicken, if you have the chickens that lay the colored eggs, like the like our Moran's and our Americanas, the younger the chicken, the darker the color will be. Um, so if your eggs start getting more pale, it's because probably the age of the chicken. Um, but we had we had one Moran. She would lay these monster eggs, and every single one of them would be a double yolk. Every single one. Have you ever hatched a double yolk? Uh, no. It just doesn't seem to be viable. Yeah. So. Do you have a recommendation on where you start with? Depends on what your goal is. You know, do just, you want the eggs? Just for eggs, yeah. Okay. Um, I, we started with Bard Rocks. I love the Bard Rocks. They were good ones. Um, the Orpingtons are good. Um, you can get buff at you know Tractor Supply, Royal King. We have the Lavender Orpingtons. They're a great uh, egg layer. They're a great meat chicken. Our Americanas, they lay a blue egg, but they're a little bit more temperamental with their laying with the seasons. They do not like the heat and they don't like the cold, so you, you know, they'll still lay, but they're not great. The Morans lay a dark chocolate color egg and they're great eggs. Shandy's Restaurant likes to use my eggs for baking stuff on my Morans, so they're, they're a really good egg. Are you talking about the pecking blocks? Yes. Um, we actually like the pecking blocks um, because it distracts them too. So like if you have a new bird you're introducing, it's good to have that distraction and the chicken toys. But the pecking blocks are just good for them. It, it entertains them. Chickens get bored easily. But yeah, we, and there's a chick block and there's a big pecking block. And we have those in with our birds. Anybody else? Um, I, yes, you have a question? Do the guineas normally stay in with the chickens all the time? I don't really see them bother each other when I, when I go over there, but I just wonder if maybe something happens or if it changes things. No, if the guineas are used to being in with the chickens, it probably wouldn't. It might have been something else that, that changed. I'm getting the signal here. <laughs> Um, but it might be something else that happened maybe with the people not being there and you coming in. Um, but if they're used to each other, even roosters. We have roosters that grow up together and they don't bother each other at all. It's just when they're not used to each other is when you have the issues. You have, uh, one or two aggressive roosters that eventually have Yeah, and, and our French black copper moran roos, they're like Satan. One I, one I called Brutus changed his name to Satan because that rooster literally would flog me every time I tried to feed him. 
he does his job really, really well, so he gets to stay around. But <laughs> he is mean, mean, mean rooster. And he's just protecting his girls. Now, the lavenders, you can pick them up. They're just the sweetest thing. Same with the Americanas. I can walk in among those roosters, and there's just no 